Welcome to the Jean Hales podcast, Women's Health Week series, where we talk about all the things you want to hear but can never ask. Here's your host, Janet Mishelmore. Today I'll be speaking with one of the most inspiring people I've ever met. In 2021, Isabel Marshall was named Young Australian of the Year. Alongside her medical degree, she is also the co-founder of Taboo Period Products. Taboo makes and sells pads and tampons, but also has a mission to stop period poverty. The thing is, sometimes accolades really don't do a person justice. Having worked in women's health for the last 30 years, I know exactly what Isabel is up against. Periods and bleeding are the last things anyone wants to talk about. And in this interview, we talk about the shame that still surrounds periods and the heartbreaking report that shows what young women are still going through in the classroom. Here's my interview with Isabel Marshall. Isabel, you and Eloise started Taboo to fight period poverty in Australia. For many of our listeners, they may not have heard that term before. So can you tell us what that means? In essence, it is just when someone can't afford or access the right products or support or education to deal with their periods in a safe, hygienic and dignified manner. And we started to realise just how prevalent this issue was overseas, but also in Australia, and how intrinsically it's linked to gender equality, to the poverty cycle, and to all these huge issues that we're trying to tackle as a world. But for some reason, things like periods and access to pads and tampons have kind of fallen through the gaps of that conversation. And that's hugely because of the stigma and the taboos around periods and menstruation, uh, which is why we're called taboo, because we want to challenge that taboo, considering this is a biological function that half of our population go through every single month and is vital for the survival of our species. We thought it's probably best to start the conversation and to stop it from being a barrier to things like education or employment. Isabel, you're so right about stigma and shame around periods. I remember as a kid, and even actually not so much of a kid, when I was in my mid-20s and even probably 30s, where I always prayed that the cashier was female. In fact, I probably held back and waiting for a female when I had period products. Can you give me some other examples of when that happens for women? Yeah, I think there's certainly examples that on a personal level, so many menstruators would relate to. I I mean, certainly I've walked through the aisle and felt this embarrassment. Sometimes you don't even look for what's the best product because you're too stressed about people seeing you in the aisle. So you just take whatever's closest, which is just absurd. But certainly I relate to that. And I know that so many people around me relate to those sorts of situations as well and feelings. In a broader sense, stigma and shame, particularly in certain cultures around the world, is so ingrained in the culture that people may need to go to, say, menstrual huts while they're bleeding. So in some cultures, uh, they're not able to be in the family home or in a religious setting while they're bleeding. And it's interesting. And my learning journey with these sorts of things has been interesting. It's very easy to, I guess, judge those practices as negative Uh, straight away coming from a completely different demographic. But I have met people who have benefited from such practices when it's done in a really dignified, understanding and empowering way. When the usually woman in these situations is, say, needing to go to this menstrual hut, sometimes that can be a dangerous setting. And whether there may be dangerous animals, there's been instances of snake bites or fires or assaults in these areas, which obviously is completely not okay. And when the woman is put at risk, that is not okay. But I have met some people who fully feel comforted and empowered in the fact that their cycle has been acknowledged. And when they're bleeding, that's the time that they step away from their duties in the household or duties as mother. And they often are there in those menstrual huts with their sisters or their friends. And that's actually a time they acknowledge their body is going through some pretty exhausting things and their family recognizes this as a safe and relaxing place for that person at that time, which is very interesting. I never thought of it in that way until I guess I was pulled up in a a few uh, settings and, and people said, no, actually, this is a cultural difference and you may not understand it or experience it yourself, but you do need to respect the differences. 
But there is, there's a line that's drawn when someone's safety is at risk or they're unable to reach their full potential because of the way they're treated during their period. That's a completely different ballpark. That is a completely different ballpark. The thing that I find fascinating about your comments, though, is that we spend our lives hiding when we're menstruating. And then this is a great recognition of when people are menstruating, the total polar opposites of what really we talk about most of the time. And I think there are real dangers or potential dangers in not recognising periods and some of the things that go with it, be it period pain, et cetera, in our communities. Yeah, I agree. The, the menstrual cycle in itself is so interesting and it's governed by these different hormones that fluctuate throughout the cycle. And different hormones we all understand and can acknowledge make you feel certain ways in certain points. And so I think it's really important that people who menstruate are given the education to understand what their body's doing in a, at a given point in the month so they can kind of harness that energy or perhaps exhaustion and, and know where it's coming from and either use that to kind of propel them into an energetic sort of phase or else give them an understanding that they may be feeling more tired or, or in pain, even though there's certain red flags that we should talk about for pain in periods as well. Isabel, I absolutely agree. It would be fabulous if those of us who had our periods or were still menstruating knew more about our cycles. And surely that education should probably come at school when most people get their periods for the first time. I suspect that education around periods has changed a lot since I was at school. And frankly, that was over 50 years ago. So what can you tell us about how period education is being handled today? Mm. Yes, yeah, so there's a brilliant report by the Commissioner for Children and Young People uh, in South Australia, Helen Connolly. The way she explains her role is that she's the voice of students. She goes to schools, she does one-on-one -on -one consultations, as well as more broader surveys. And she gathers all the information about how the students are feeling at school, what their main barriers are and what their main concerns are, perhaps maybe what they're enjoying the most about their schooling experience as well. And she's been in this role for, I think, four years and constantly the issue of periods kept cropping up. And so she did a deep dive and she created this amazing report called Menstruation Matters, which was tabled earlier this year. And in Menstruation Matters, she highlights some of the main concerns that students have relating to period poverty. And what she found is that period poverty certainly exists in South Australia. And that makes total sense because poverty also exists in South Australia. And where there is poverty and people who bleed, you're going to find period poverty. But she also highlighted, as we said before, those issues of stigma and shame. And those issues of stigma and shame really manifested in a young menstruators not being able to voice their concerns at school or to their teachers, to their parents, to their family members, to their peers. And it also manifested in things like bullying or teasing or when a pad falls out of a bag and suddenly that's the butt of a joke for the next couple of weeks, which is hugely degrading when it's a biological function that, that you should feel proud of that demonstrates you're growing up and that your body is strong and something that half of your cohort is going to be going through as well. It just seems absurd that it becomes the butt of a joke. But it does affect people's schooling and it affects how they view themselves and their environment that they're learning in. But even more so than that, there's problems around access to toilets, facilities, the inability to go to the toilet during class because of school rules, which is a problem when you're sitting on your seat bleeding. Also, just things like the school policy regarding uniforms and what's most appropriate when someone's bleeding and how to best support them during that time, which is one week of every month, which is quite a substantial amount of time. So probably something we should consider when we're planning our infrastructure and policies and rules and expectations. I think this report also addressed girls not being prepared to talk about period pain. What have you learned about girls talking about period pain and, in fact, how much school they miss due to period pain? Mm, that is such an interesting question. What we, and I, I know Jean Howes has been so involved in this, um, have discovered recently is that one in nine people who menstruate in Australia have endometriosis. And endometriosis, if there are listeners who uh, haven't heard that quite complicated sounding phrase or term before, is when tissue that's like the lining of the uterus uh, grows outside of the uterus and it responds to the same hormones that tell the uterus to shed its lining, so to create the period, 
But that tissue has nowhere to go when it's outside of the uterus because it doesn't have a vagina to exit the body through. So there's real issues when that tissue is trying to kind of shed, but it's outside of the uterus and it causes extreme inflammation and pain. And that concept of pain is a really interesting one because for generations and generations, for centuries, it's been really, really difficult to quantify pain because it can be such a subjective thing with so many factors attached to it. And in the past, when women haven't been taken as seriously or considered as strong or resilient, it's been easy for these complaints of pain to be shrugged off as someone being too sensitive or looking for attention and crazy things like this, when in actual fact, when it's related to the period, it may be endometriosis, which is an extremely legitimate pathology that causes pain. And so there's been lots of factors, I think, that have led to that pain not being diagnosed or considered or acknowledged. And a lot of that stems from things like gender inequality and these idea of women having hysteria instead of having actual issues, but also shame and stigma around the period. Isabel, I've got one last question, and I really want to return to the topic of taboo. How does taboo fight period poverty in Australia? And really, how can our listeners get involved? Yes, absolutely. As I said before, period poverty exists wherever there is poverty and wherever there is people menstruating. And we certainly have those groups in our country as well. And I I do want to note as well that period poverty is about, yes, the, the unaffordability of the products, but also the inaccessibility of products. And we have many towns and communities in Australia that are very regional and that may have only one convenience store or one place where people can buy pads. And often in those circumstances, a packet of 10 pads can go for like up to $10, which is huge, um, especially for, for families that are already under financial pressure. And that's something that is dropped often to the end of the shopping list and often scrubbed off if other things need to be prioritized, such as food or health related services or products and things like that. So yes, there's certainly period poverty in Australia. And yes, it affects people's schooling. It affects their employment. It affects their engagement in social and community aspects of their life as well. So we recognize this at Taboo and we created this pad it forward model, which is obviously a play on pay it forward. But we have an option on our website where you can subscribe to our product. So our pads on behalf of someone in Australia who needs it. So at the end of every month, we gather all of these incredibly generously donated products and then we distribute them to our partner organisations around the country uh, to make sure that those pads, so our taboo pads that have been donated by our amazing customers, end up in the hands of people experiencing period poverty in Australia. So a lot of them are health clinics, schools, domestic violence, crisis care centres, There's Aboriginal centres, there's rural regional centres. There's a whole group of them and we have an incredibly generous base of people who are so passionate about donating these products every single month. And that's only $7 usually that comes out of their account every single month and that's one packet of pads and it makes a huge difference to people around Australia. Isabel, seriously, I've had the best time. Thank you so much. Me too, thank you. It's been fabulous and I've learned a lot too. Isabel Marshall is doing remarkable work and I would encourage all of our listeners to get behind Taboo. Please listen to more interviews in our Women's Health Week series and thank you so much for listening. You've been listening to the Jean Howes podcast Women's Health Week series. You can find out more about Taboo by visiting tabooau.co. For free expert health information about periods, endometriosis, PCOS or heavy menstrual bleeding, visit genehales.org.au.